Hello, and welcome to part one of this Anatomy of an Instrument Performance. Um, here I'm going to be talking about some technical issues. I'm going to go into the setup of my uh, Ableton session, uh, setup of the instrument, and then some sound design and MIDI setup and things of that sort. So that should be fun. In part two, I will talk about more musical issues and I'll actually be doing a practice session and talking about um, what kind of practice patterns I'm working on and how I go about structuring the performance or at least preparing to structure the performance. But anyways, this is part one and I'm gonna sound something like this. Okay, so um, first I'll just talk a little bit about the instrument. I'm set up with a split. So I've got, this is my left split, and over here I've got my right split. Um, I'm just using this to control some drones, so you can start it and stop it just by pressing that, but um, I'm not really playing any notes here. So the bulk of the instrument is my main sound. <laughs> feel like a guitar player. I'm in channel per row. So each row is going to be a different instrument. And um, I'm not set up in MPE mode. So channel per row using I'm using channels seven through 14 for my, um, for the rows. So channel seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. And because I'm not in MPE mode, my Y axis is set to CC one, the modulation wheel. And my Z axis is after touch and my pitch bend range is 24. So if I go over here to Ableton Live, this is my DAW. Um, I set this up also not in MPE mode. So my MIDI setup. We've got this uh, ultralight MIDI port. Here's where my instrument MIDI is coming from and MPE is turned off. And if we also go look at one of these tracks. I have serum here, you'll also see MPE is turned off. And so I have seven mostly identical tracks here. Sorry, eight mostly identical tracks. Each one of them has the serum and all these serum patches are very similar. There are a couple differences. So um, because things were getting a little shrieky and the high notes, 
I did a few things. So this is just um, in the mixer. My top row is turned down 20 decibels. And the next row is minus 10. And the next one's minus 5. And that's because I'm using so much distortion that um, the volumes really even out when I do that. And it gets really shrieky and unpleasant when I leave this one turned all the way up. Um, another thing I did for the top two rows is in Serum itself. I'm not going to give like a full tutorial of Serum here, but it's a, it's a really cool synth. And you can basically build your wavetables by just drawing harmonics. So here's my first harmonic and second, or sorry, the first one is the fundamental. And what I've done here is I've told this to clear the high frequencies. So there were all kinds of other harmonics here, which will alias a whole lot at these really high notes because I'm on the top row here. So I just like got rid of them. I don't need them for these top couple rows. Um, and that makes it sound a little more pleasant there. But if I go back to if I go back to this row, you'll see there's much more harmonic content in this wavetable. Okay, so let's look at this uh, let's look at this wavetable in depth a little bit. Um, now, first, I'm going to go turn off the uh, effects that I have on everything. So that's what my instrument sounds like without all that distortion and everything. So this, these oscillators are built out of samples of a sort of fiddle thing that I built. And so I've basically got four waveforms here that I'm morphing between. And this morphing is controlled mostly by the y-axis. Mostly. We'll go into the matrix in a couple minutes. So here at the bottom of my y-axis, so where my uh, finger is closest to the lower row, you can see that um, over here in the, uh, in the harmonics, there's almost no fundamental at all at this lowest position. as opposed to I'm in different positions. And the idea behind that is um, it's like if you're playing a bowed stringed instrument and you're just like barely touching the string with the bow. So you're making a kind of shrieky noise, but you're not really digging in and vibrating the string to its full potential. Um, so then in the middle, I have about here. That has the, well, let's just go here. At this position, we have the, uh, it basically just looks like a sine wave with some bumps in it. Um, that's the strongest fundamental part. And then as we go further on, it morphs more. And at the top position, we bring in more harmonics with a really strong third, which is the kind of thing you get when you have a guitar feeding back. It'll, it'll bring out that third harmonic. And 
And so this gives me a nice range of tones to play with in my sound. It comes kind of vocal up there. So that's the basic oscillator setup. I also have oscillator B. Let's take a look at this. I don't remember where the sounds of this came from. This one's going to be just more, more crazy harmonic. So I've turned off A so we can just hear this one. Yeah, so that's not doing a lot. It's just adding a little bit of character to the sound. And I'll take a look at the modulation matrix. And there's a lot of different stuff going on here. What I'll normally do in my sound design process is, you know, I'll build the basic thing, which will just have Y-axis controlling timbre, um, Z-axis or pressure controlling volume to some degree. And then I'll play with it a bunch and I'll tweak it and I'll add all kinds of all kinds of different things. You can see this is a very complicated matrix now. I'll go into the entire thing. Oh wait, the aftertouch is controlling the warp on B. Okay, that's not terribly interesting right now. Anyways, the idea behind this is I get a very complex sound with a lot of subtleties to it when I have all these different modulation sources controlling different things. And I think that's, I like my sounds to resemble nature in some way, and that's the way nature is. Very complex, although subtle in some ways. Um, and if I go in, each of these tracks here could be thought of as a string. Each one has its own serum instance. And it also has the sketch cassette, which is turned off right now because my, uh, my computer can't really handle this video I'm trying to make. It's just not fast enough to do the, uh, do all the sound and the video and the screen recording. So. I'm making some compromises. Well, let's look at sketch cassette. You won't be able to hear what it's doing, which is why I figured it was okay to leave it off, turned off for this recording. But um, sketch cassette is one of my favorite plugins. It has the most beautiful interface, as you can see. And this is just going to like give you a very slight tape sound to your track. And each one of these that I have on these tracks is different in terms of its wow depth and rate and things like that. So that just makes every string have its own slightly different character to it, which again goes back to that idea of subtle complexity. So those are the tracks. Now let's go back up here and turn the effects back on. And it's going to sound very different. But you can still hear like this, um, the shrill, very lack of fundamental in the bottom of the position. I apologize for my sniffliness. I'm getting over COVID, which was so much fun.
Another uh, key element of this sound I need to talk about is the expression pedal. So I've got a little expression pedal USB interface um, plugged in and it's controlling some things. It gives me kind of a macro control over all the strings or all the rows. And let's see which track is that. That should be this one here. Uh, this is a Max for Live plugin that I found um, called Grid Function with a K. Um, I picked this up from maxforlive.com. I think that's what it's called. And it's by by Lal, I suppose. I will I will check that. Anyways, it's a really cool plugin. This is giving me a response curve that I get to draw and use for the expression pedal so that it will be less of an effect as it's more down. And as I push it up, it'll you know exponentially increase, which I find is really necessary, at least for this expression pedal. I can't get the uh I can't get the kind of response that I want without adding this curve. Curves are really important in general, I find, in sound design for the instrument. If I go back to the serum and look at the matrix, you can see I've I've added a response curve to all of these different uh, parameters. Because that will give you just a much better level of control over things. Um, so what is the expression pedal doing? Um, it's doing a number of things. Most important thing is it's controlling this macro. All of my uh, instrument rows are grouped. Um, so this is like the master track for all of them. This is where all the effects are. And this macro goes up and down when I push the pedal. And what is this macro controlling? It's controlling the gain on a pedal for distortion and overdrive. It's controlling the volume on my amp simulator, but it's doing that backwards. So the more I go, the quieter it gets. And the reason for that is just because I'm using so much distortion that it would get crazy otherwise. Um, so that's, so I'm using that controlling the volume in order to balance things out a bit. Expression pedal macro is also controlling the frequency on this auto filter here. That's for a sort of a wah kind of effect. That may be it. That may be everything that it's controlling. Um, oh, there's one other thing. Um, you're not going to be able to hear this right now, although it will be evident in the other video, part two. I have another, I have an audio track in the group with all my serum tracks. And this is just recording directly from my speaker. So when I'm monitoring this through the speakers, it will give me some crazy feedback. I'm not doing that right now because I'm recording my voice in this session and I don't want lots of feedback going on. So I'm monitoring with headphones, um, but you will be able to hear this. You know, it's a kind of like a classic guitar feedback kind of sound, um, just the microphone picking up the speaker and running it back through all this distortion. This, the volume of this feedback audio and also another auto filter are also being controlled by the uh, expression pedal. And I've got some uh, resonators 
and EQ. Outer spaces reverb and the phaser and compression and another filter to block out all the uh, really low frequencies. Basically, I'm doing a lot of work to shape this feedback and make it sound more pleasant and less horrible and work better musically. Um, if I come back to the, uh, to the guitar track, I'll just, it's not a guitar track, sorry. The group effects, I'll just go over what each one is doing. So I've got the, the pedal, which is just an overdrive. I have this super tube plugin, which emulates a tube amplifier, I suppose. This is a nice, fairly cheap plugin from Soundspear. It gives things a neat, uh, crispy warmness. And I've got two of those on it just to give it some variation in the character. Not really variation in the character, a more complex character, put it that way. Um, I'm using the amp sim. This one is a built-in live effect. And I've got it on the heavy metal guitar sound with a lot of gain. So things get nuts. <laughs> Next, I've got an isotope trash. Uh, this one's not having as big an effect on this set as I thought it would, or as I usually use it to do. But um, I use this as my um, cabinet simulation, basically. Um, I use the Convolve, and I've got a Marshall Amp Impulse in there. So this is this is kind of doing the same thing that uh, Ableton's cabinet does. There are a lot more options with the uh, with trash, including you can use your own impulses wherever you find them, and that just gives some uh, body to the sound and um, body and character. Here's what it sounds like without that at all. Here, I'll turn it up all the way. So you see it's more guitar-like, more like an electric guitar when, it, when I have it turned up all the way. Um, but I'm mixing it down because I needed more, more of the lower frequencies to come through, I think. So that's trash. Next up, I have the auto filter, which I already talked about for the wah effect. And I just have another utility in this group with the auto filter. Utility is not really doing anything. This is just so that I can get a wet and dry mix on this group because I don't want the filter to entirely cut out my high frequencies. Next up, I have an EQ, which is just, you know, gently shaping the sound a little bit. Again, this is a very harsh sound in the high frequencies, so there are a lot of places where I'm cutting down on those, um, especially in the 3 or 4K range. Next up, I have a Stardust. This is a emulation of the Roland Space Echo. It's Roland, right? Yeah. This is another fun plugin. Most of my plugins, um, I want to say, are 
fairly cheap because yeah um and they're really cool but you can do this you can do this kind of thing with ableton's echo also um i just like the character of this uh of this one let me uh turn it off so the echo that you're hearing now is ableton's echo and i've turned off the stardust so if i bring it back you'll hear that it becomes much dirtier and muddier and warmer and it's also got a motor sound going on i'm not sure whether you'll be able to hear it but there's there's kind of a little hiss to it and uh and a little hum to it then i have a limiter just to make things louder levels get way out of whack when you're using all these distortions and everything and then i have ableton's own echo which i'm just doing the uh this is pretty much the default thing that you get when you put echo on there except i've turned down the wetness uh, the wet and dry of the echo is also controlled by the uh by the expression pedal so that i get more echo when i'm in the very soft kind of sound <laughs> So I love I love the character of the Stardust, but um, Ableton's built-in echo is also quite nice and useful, and that's why I'm using them both. I'm just going nuts on this sound. Uh, next up, I have a convolution reverb. Uh, here it is without that. <laughs> It's hard to really tell that one. That's giving it a subtle. This is one of my um, sympathetic strings impulses. So that's to give it, to make it ring out as if there were a bunch of other strings on the instrument. But it's kind of a subtle effect with all this uh, distortion and everything going on. So I won't go into that too much. Uh, next there's Phase Mistress which is just a phaser by Sound Toys. So again, uh, you could use Ableton's built-in phaser if you wanted to. Um, I don't know if you can really hear this. This is like, yeah, that's another subtle thing. I won't go talk about it too much. Um, and then I have another sketch cassette. And this one I've left on, and this is just giving that tapey sound to the whole group. <laughs> Again, this is a subtle thing. I will uh, play a little bit with that turned off to see if we can hear the difference, but probably not. Turn it back on. Okay, I think that's it for my effects okay getting close to the end there are a couple other things i'm doing one is i've got this drone it's on this track and i trigger it with uh the right end of my split so, and i can do a couple different notes with it And that's got like a, this works well with the kind of music I'm doing here. Um, because I'm going to be playing basically the, the same scale for the whole piece, but, uh, changing the drone underneath it will 
shift that scale into different modes and give it different characters and express different things. Um, take a quick look at this drone. This just moves very slowly with an LFO. And you can see it's like bouncing back and forth. So there are a couple different LFOs on this. Very complex wavetable uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm more or less using this wavetable as an ambient music generator. It's going to go through it very slowly, but. You can see I have, this is made up of six different um, waveforms and they all, each one sounds very different and it, this goes back to the uh, subtle complexity idea. So this will be changing throughout the whole time it plays, but in a very subtle way, that's not really going to draw your attention, but at the same time, it'll make the whole thing sound less robotic. Okay. And the last component, which I must have silenced, yes, I have another serum track up here. This one's going to have a chiny bell sound to it. And this is going to be playing just this basic. I think this is one of my Pittsburgh modular waveforms. So this is a triangle wave from my modular synth sampled at different, with the filter cut off in different places. So it'll go from this nice triangle down to this sine wave. And it's being FM'd, frequency modulation, by oscillator A, which is a bunch of different waveforms that I put together based on different prime numbers. Um, so that's a good way to get bell kind of sounds I have found because these prime number harmonics don't harmonize with the fundamental. So like even if you have just the one harmonic, it's going to give you a kind of metallic sound. And what I'm doing with this chimey guy is a lot of different reverbs on it. I'm not going to talk about those too much. Um, I've got this Max for Live arpeggiator that I made. Um, and it's just going to play whatever note I'm playing at different octaves, one of five different octaves, and at a random time because as you'll hear if you listen to the piece, uh, rhythm or a beat is kind of the furthest thing from my mind when I'm doing something like this. This is just not that kind of music. Um, so the durations of things will be more of a melodic component rather than a kind of dancey thing. Um, and it's nice to have a very arrhythmic chime going along. So it's kind of like a wind chime playing with you. but it helpfully plays the same note you're playing. So that's nice. Um, now you should be able to hear it when I play a little more. Okay, I need more density maybe. Why am I not hearing this? Here? crank up the density. Um, maybe some other time I will go into this random arpeggiator, but any random arpeggiator will do. There, now you can hear it.
I just find that with the uh, with the drone and with the chimes going on, I get a very rich and complex sound happening with um but it's still all under my control so I can like I can invent the entire piece and it will sound kind of lush and symphonic even though there's just one of me playing and I'm not doing anything super complicated <laughs> And a neat quirk to this um, chime thing. So it's it's listening to all of my MIDI channels, so it'll play whatever row I'm playing. But it does not. It's not using pitch bend. So if I play a note and then I bend that note, I slide to a different uh, to a different note. The chime will continue on the first note, so I can get a little bit of harmony that way. Okay, so I think that is about everything I wanted to go over. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer in comments. That's always nice too, because if you like get into a conversation in the comments, you can get like a hundred comments, and then your video looks much more impressive to the algorithm. That's it for part one. I hope you will join me for part two, which, as I said before, will be more musical and more about the practicing with this sound and I should have a link to the final performance here somewhere so I'll stick that in at the end as well um, thank you for watching